Hey, Derek. Hey, thanks for thanks for braving the 407. Oh, th thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you here. Great you to be here. are the executive director of the Christian Legal Fellowship. First of all, thank you on behalf of the faith community for your important work, and uh, and you're also a general legal counsel yourself, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Well, how long have you been in this role, in this position? So I've been with CLF for three years. I've been practicing law for ten years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I tell people that I'm, I work with a, an organization of Christian lawyers, the reaction I often get is that's an and oxymoron. it's a non-profit. It's a non-profit. A lawyer, like, and, and people it's are like, like, what, you went to law school to work with that? Yeah, well, they, they give me that reaction too, yeah. Um, but the, uh, you know, the one that I often get is that's like a lawyer joke, right? Like Christianity and law and they don't mix. But, you know, from our perspective, we believe very strongly mm -hmm. that we need faithful men and women in the legal profession. Mm -hmm. And especially in cases that we'll be talking about today, mm -hmm. you know, it's so important that we have people there that can represent faith communities in a way that the broader culture and the broader public and especially legal decision makers can really understand. Mm -hmm. And so is that the heart of why you chose this direction rather than practicing law in a private way? I think that's part of it. I, I think a lot of it too is uh, when I became a dad, I started thinking about my kids and the next generation and um, thinking about what kind of country are our kids going to grow up in? Um, how free will they be to pursue their faith? Whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, just lit a fire in me uh, and a passion for religious freedom. Wow. And I know that that's not just me. We have um, a membership of, a, of about 700 lawyers who are all very passionate about these issues. For the sake of the next generation. Absolutely. Powerful. Now, one of the reasons that we have you in studio today is we want to talk about the recent Supreme Court Trinity Western ruling regarding the law school. And so right now, what I want to do is I want to watch a clip from the House of Commons with you. This is several members of Parliament who made statements regarding the case before it went to the Supreme Court. And then uh, 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 some voices, national voices, articulating regarding the verdict, and then we'll talk about the implications, if that's okay. Sounds good. Okay, let's watch this. Mr. Speaker, freedom of religion is a value that Canadians hold dear. Sadly, there are some people, businesses, and even law societies that are opposing this value. Citing Trinity Western University Student Code of Conduct, they say that either Trinity should not be allowed to have a law school or that Trinity graduates should not be allowed to practice law. I call on all opponents, Mr. Speaker, of Trinity Western University's future law school to withdraw their opposition and support the important Canadian value of freedom of religion. Canadians were shocked to hear that the Law Societies of Ontario and Nova Scotia voted not to certify Trinity's law graduates for practice in their province. The reason isn't because of Trinity's highly respected academic standards, no. These law societies voted against Trinity because they didn't like Trinity's Christian code of conduct for students that chose to attend. This is a dangerous attack on religious freedoms in Canada and it affects all of us. Canada is a country known for human rights and religious freedom. The intolerance demonstrated by these law societies tarnishes Canada's international rep reputation, making it hypocritical for, for Canada to speak out internationally when our own religious freedoms are under attack from within. In 1981, Canada enacted the Charter of Rights, which guarantees religious freedoms in strong terms. It means you cannot deny a job to a qualified applicant because you don't agree with their religious beliefs, as the Ontario Law Society recently did to graduates of Trinity Western University. Okay. If a lawyer passes the bar exam and has had a thorough legal education, it is beyond belief that they would be excluded from legal practice because of the religious beliefs here, here. of their school about marriage. If anti-religious ideologues have led the Ontario Law Society to adopt such an extreme discriminatory measure, it's time for progressive-minded rights advocates to speak out loudly. Such tyranny never stops with a single victim. This isn't just a Trinity Western issue, not just a law society issue. It isn't even just a Christian minority issue. It is an issue for anyone who advocates for freedom from tyranny. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled on whether Trinity Western University's proposed law school should be accredited. While the court had strong language affirming individual religious freedom and its expression, in a split decision, the majority ruled that the Law Society's decision not to accredit the law school is a reasonable decision, given the facts of the case. 
This is a long and complicated decision of over 250 pages with four separate opinions. It will take time to understand its implications. It is a sad day. How we as Christians respond matters. It is part of our witness. This is a blow, but we are people of faithfulness and hope. Please pray for Trinity Western University as I digest the implications of this decision. And please pray that we will all manifest Christ's light and life in our response. What it's saying in losing this case is that you are not allowed to bring those Christian views that training in a Christian setting is going to prejudice your practice of law. It's actually the first case I know of where we're actually hearing that Canadians will not tolerate Christianity in a very important part of the normal ebb and flow of Canadian life. Wow. Potent words. Canadians will not tolerate Christianity when you and I both know that, you know, scriptures are all over the foundation of this nation, all over the Parliament of Canada. Wow, a lot to digest there. Um, so you were intimately involved with this case at the Supreme Court. Tell us about it. Yes, well, I was one of the lawyers for Christian Legal Fellowship, and uh, we intervened as a friend of the court. So we're a third-party, independent organization that's there bringing our legal expertise um, to help the court understand some of the nuances of the case. So basically, you just got to make commentary on the case. Exactly. So you weren't necessarily defending anyone or speaking for anyone, just speaking to. Precisely. And of course, we're there because we support Trinity Western's rights. Mm -hmm. um, but Trinity Western has their own lawyers. And I want to say there were a lot of uh, really uh, wonderful lawyers that were involved in this case, all advocating for freedom of religion. I was just one of them, and I was humbled to be part of that team. Um, but for us, the reason we got involved was we felt very strongly that no one in Canada should be punished for their religious beliefs. And that includes upholding a traditional belief in marriage. And we were concerned that that's what was happening here, and we're still concerned that that's what's happening here. We we're also very concerned about the larger precedent that this case would set, that this wasn't just about Trinity, as you heard in some of the clips we just watched, that this would have an impact on all people of faith in Canada and how government actors could treat faith communities when those faith communities held beliefs that were different from the state's approved views. Um, so we saw that as being a very wetter, watershed uh, moment in our, in our jurisprudence. Really, the case at the end of the day was about how free we are to live at our faith in the public square. And a lot of the lower courts understood this. Before we got to the Supreme Court, this was litigated in three provinces in six lower courts. And I think the, the British Columbia Court of Appeal said it best. They said that uh, this case was really about freedom and that a society that cannot accommodate and admit of difference is not truly a free and democratic society. Hmm. One in which citizens are free to think, to debate, to dialogue, to disagree with the accepted view without reprisal. Um, now, I, can I, if I could introduce yeah. something, I think people who are in support of the Supreme Court decision would say, listen, nobody's uh, saying that you can't practice your Christian faith personally, but basically what they're saying is that uh, an institution can't uh, require people who participate in that institution to believe a certain thing. Um, is that accurate? And do you have any commentary on that? That's absolutely what some of the counter arguments were in this case. And in fact, even the Supreme Court hinted at that to say, you know, nothing in this decision prevents people from holding these beliefs and adhering to them. Um, but where it became a problem was when people tried to do that in community. Mm -hmm. And mm. my response to that is, what is religion? What is faith but a place where people can come together in community and not be forced into isolation in living out their faith and living out their beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, our Supreme Court up till now has always had a very strong, robust understanding of freedom of religion. They have always said that it protects your right to express your beliefs, not just privately and not just individually, but publicly mm -hmm. and in community with others. And in fact, international human rights instruments protect that as a fundamental part of our freedom as well. Mm. So to say that your freedom of religion is limited to what you can sort of believe personally in the privacy of your own home or within the walls of your church is a very narrow and I would say very impoverished understanding of religion. So I want to ask a real direct question here. So what does this mean for Christian education across the board? If you can't have a Christian law school, does that mean that you can't have a Christian high school or a Christian elementary school or you can't be a Christian who homeschools? Where, do, where does this end? Well, strictly speaking, the good news is that this decision very clearly 
applies only to Trinity Western's law school. The court made that very clear that the facts, the decision, does not apply outside of the limited context of Trinity Western's law school. But is it precedent setting? That is the, that is the bigger question and the bigger concern. Um, we are, you know, from our perspective, this case has to be looked at within the realm of the very specific facts. We had a law society with a unique statutory mandate. That was the focus of the court's decision. Um, so in future cases, absolutely a judge could distinguish this case from other cases, and in our view, should, because of you know, the, the way that the Supreme Court handled this issue, we think needs, needs to be handled differently by future judges. So that's the good news, that this is limited, and the court went out of its way in several occasions to say, this is a limited scope a decision. Having said that, hmm. we'd be naive to think that this decision won't impact the work of like-minded organizations moving forward. So that's so the potential implication. That is the potential that's implication. That's the big unknown. That's the big unknown. Mm. And so absolutely, we need um, people to take note of this decision. Uh, pastors, uh, faith leaders, Christian organizations, all organizations of minority faith communities, I think should be troubled by this decision. Mm -hmm. Because what at the end of the day, the court recognized that what the law societies were doing in rejecting a law degree from Trinity Western, the majority acknowledged that that violated freedom of religion. But they said that violation was justified because it promoted the values of equality and diversity. Mm -hmm. So that is the big problem is now we're saying that certain values, which really vary from judge to judge, mm -hmm. could effectively trump our constitutional rights, which are very clearly spelled out in the Constitution. Right, and we now have this situation because of the construct of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms where judges are having to decide which group rights uh, trump others, right? Because here you have sexual rights that went head to head with Christian or religious freedom and they had to make a decision of which was on top, which is a, a really interesting dynamic for a nation to have to be in where we're actually against each other instead of all working together towards a common goal. So we're gonna go to a clip right now, but in a moment I wanna come back and talk to you not just about Trinity Western, but whether or not we're seeing this in other realms of Canadian society as well. But we'll talk about that right after this.